Uh, so, good, good afternoon. Can you see and hear me? Can, thank you. Thank you very much. Good <coughs> afternoon, Mr. Scott. Uh, can we turn, please, to uh, our next topic? Uh, I would like, if I may, to examine your role in the um, genesis, creation, and purpose of the Ismay report of 2010. And can we start, please, uh, back in February 2010 by looking at FUJ 0015-6120. And if we can start, um, this is an email chain, so we're going to have to start at the back, which is page eight, please. And if we just um, scroll down a little bit, please, and a bit more, we can see this is an email from Carol Ballon, a contract advisor uh, in southeast of England area. And then scroll up, please, to the top of the page. It's to Mandy Talbot, a lawyer within the post office, um, and others, Lynn Norbury, Jessica Marden, and Dominic um, Williams. And it's the... Um, to do with a large debt outstanding in the Oldsford branch, okay? And she says, Mandy, I'm aware uh, that there are many cases at the moment, both current and ex-postmasters, where there are challenges regarding the integrity of the Horizon system. And so just stopping there at the moment, at that time, were you aware of many cases in which the um, integrity of the Horizon system was being challenged, February 2010? I was becoming aware because of the JFSA, but I wasn't aware of explicit examples. We're going to see in a moment that you're copied into this chain. Mm -hmm. okay. But you say that you were aware because of the JFSA. What were you aware of because of the JFSA? They'd just been set up. And uh, what did that um, tell you? What did you learn from the setting up of the JFSA? Um, that there were challenges around the horizon integrity. Had you seen an article in Computer Weekly in 2009? I've been seeing it in the bundle. Um, I don't recollect it, uh, but I may have seen it. Were you aware of some coverage by the BBC in 2009-10 um, over horizon integrity problems? I don't recall that. In any event, this contract advisor in, for the southeast of England, or one of them, is aware of many cases where there are challenges regarding the integrity of um, Horizon. And then in the next um, three or four paragraphs, she sets out some background to the case in particular, okay, which we needn't read. Essentially, there was a debt, and she wants to... Um, some advice, please, from Mandy Talbot, the lawyer, um, about how to, how to handle it. And it seems like there must have been an attachment to it, which we haven't got, um, concerning a request for um, access for the purposes of an examination by an expert witness. And she um, says at the end, uh, Ms. Ballon, please can I have your advice on a response to her solicitors? And then can we go please to page seven? and look at the foot of the page. That's it. Um, we can see this is an email, if we just scroll down, that's it, um, from Mandy Talbot on to um, David um, X. Smith, who is the um, uh, head of change and IS. And he says, sorry, she says to him, has the post office received requests like this before? And if so, how has it responded to them? Does the business in principle have any objection to meeting with, quote, a computer expert <clears throat> and explaining to him how the system works, possibly even showing him the data? It may be beneficial in resolving this case, but it will set a precedent. If we refuse, I anticipate there is no way that we'll be able to recoup any money on the sale of the branch without litigation, which will revolve around computer evidence. I've looked up Vela, who appears to be featured on a number of websites as a computer expert, but what his experience is in the field is impossible to tell. Your opinion would be really useful to us in advising the business how it should respond to the requests. 
against the background of attacks on Horizon in the press and the courts. So we've got somebody in the southeast of England asking for advice on a particular branch, it being um, rooted by Mandy Talbot um, to um, David uh, Smith. Then if we can look, please, at um, his reply. That actually, um, we can see it's signed off at the end of the page there. Um, we actually have to go to page five. And the foot of the page of page five. Uh, Mandy, forgive me if this is a rather long response, but it's important given my impending departure from the post office that my logic is fully understood after I'm uh, no longer around to ask. Um, I've been embroiled in the various newspaper, TV and flag case letters, all claiming that Horizon is at fault. As yet, I haven't seen a single shred of evidence to back up these claims. However, a recent meeting with MPs encapsulated the issue we face very nicely. People know that computer systems go wrong from time to time, particularly government computer systems, and therefore believe that a computer system such as Horizon could have caused these discrepancies. As long as the argument is carried out on the level of what could happen, then we will always struggle to win it. Our greatest chance of winning the argument, case by case, is to fix the debate on what actually happened. Two cases of which I believe you are familiar further reinforce this view and shape my response to your question. In the case refers to as Cleveley's, an independent expert was appointed. Unfortunately, the post office in Fujitsu did not manage this spectacularly well and probably fielded the wrong people, or at the very least, insufficiently briefed people. I read the so-called expert's report, and I have to say it was far from the professional effort I would have expected. There was no sign of a syst systematic approach to evidence gathering, or that the expert had gained essential knowledge of how Horizon enables accounting integrity to be maintained. The expert concluded that Horizon could have created discrepancies. Crucially, the audit logs, which would have proven what did happen on the system, had not been retained. We settled out of court. This matter was determined on what could have happened. Now, stopping there, the reference to the Cleveley's case. When did you first become aware of the Cleveley's case? Uh, I don't recall it. I think, no, just don't recall it. So um, you, in due course, we will see, got this email chain, yep. and so you would have been aware of it at least by February 2010. Okay. I.e. that description of it. Yeah. I, I don't even remember seeing this in my bundle, so... Okay, well, um, if we go um, forwards to page four... Um, we can see an email that you sent on this chain. Can you see that? Yes. From you to Sue Lowther. Yes. And it, when we get to the top of the chain, we'll see more correspondence from you. Okay. Uh, going back, please, um, um, I think we were on Mr. Um, Smith's long reply on page six. <laughs> Um, if we scroll down, in the case of Castleton, we were able to disclose the audit log. My recollection is that Castleton's solicitor or an expert retained by the solicitor examined the log and, con and concluded that Horizon did not cause the discrepancy. I seem to remember that Castleton fired the solicitor and declined, sorry, decided to continue um, with his counterclaim. He lost, exclamation mark. Having heard Castleton's arguments, the judge decided that there was, quote, no flaw in the Horizon system, and that, quote, the logic of the system is correct. He said that, quote, the conclusion is inescapable that the Horizon system was working property in all material respects. We won the case on the basis of what had actually happened. But never mind for the moment whether that is in any way an accurate summary of what happened. Um, had you heard of the um, Castleton case before now, 2010? No, I don't recall it, no. He, Mr Smith, continues, um, I believe that we should therefore allow an expert to examine the audit log, having been fully briefed on how Horizon maintained integrity, as this gives us the best chance of winning the argument. However, we need to do so in a controlled manner, and I suggest the following way forwards. One, it's not clear whether we've examined um, the audit log for this branch over the period during which the discrepancies occurred. If not, we should do so. 
be also useful to understand the details of the investigation, including a statement from product and branch accounting as to whether it's possible that there, is an there are outstanding correction, transaction corrections. Two, Horizon is a very complex system. We should ensure that the experience of the expert equips him to carry out the task. Being a bit of a whiz on a PC wouldn't make the guy an expert. I expect a background in the technical detail of, of say, large-scale banking systems as the experience that would equip someone to carry out this task. This is not just in our interests, it's also in the interest of the sub-postmistress. Three, we should control the process. Firstly, whoever faces off to the expert, and I'd suggest a combined post office Fujitsu effort, should have, the, should have first immersed themselves in what we discover from one so that they can prepare their explanation in the light of what we know. Secondly, we should set out how Horizon maintains integrity and illustrate how this is ensured and explain how the audit log demonstrates this integrity. Then and only then should we hand over the audit log. Finally, we should ensure that the expert has an open channel to our experts to follow up any queries. Finally, and we possibly can't, uh, possibly can't insist on this, we should try to get the opportunity to comment on any report that's drafted before it is finalised. So overall, Mr Smith was saying, would you agree in summary, that he, um, he was keen to ensure that the expert has got to be, quote, the right expert. He has got to um, understand the processes which protect the integrity of um, the Horizon system. And he points to the Castleton case to support his approach. Yes. Um, can we um, go, please, to um, page five? We can see, if we just scroll down a little bit, we can see it's Mandy Talbot's email, and then scroll back up again. Uh, she replies, Dave, thanks for the comprehensive reply. Who uh, do you suggest we go to within the business and Fujitsu to obtain the full audit logs? Sorry that you're going to be leaving us. Can you suggest who we should talk to about horizon issues after you've gone? Um, I agree that once we get everything, um, we can together. It should be examined by Paul and Fujitsu again. Can you suggest some useful candidates who are expert, but also quite robust, so as to be able to capable of rebutting anything that the sub uh, postmistress's expert can throw at us? Just stopping there, would that have been the prevailing attitude on your understanding at the time, that um, the imperative <coughs> was um, to be robust and rebut anything that suggested that Horizon lacked integrity? I don't recall that. What was the prevailing attitude of t at the time? One of openness as to the possibility that there might be Horizon flaws? Um, no, I think the feedback from the business and from people like Dave Smith was that the uh, Horizon system was robust and reliable. And therefore, if you read this, you wouldn't see anything wrong in uh, getting somebody who was themselves robust so that they could rebut anything that uh, an independent expert might throw at them? I mean, clearly, uh, that's what Dave Smith is recommending. I'm sorry, I missed that. That's clearly what Dave Smith is recommending. Yes, uh, you wouldn't see anything wrong in that? No. Uh, she continues, ultimately, given the complexity of the Horizon system, there are many... Uh, are there any external individuals or firms who you can recommend who, who, who would have the appropriate background to create a proper report in case poll has to defend itself? And then the reply, please, on page four. At the foot of the page, uh, David Smith replies, I'm on holiday in Mexico. Uh, John and Rod have individuals who access the audit log via Fujitsu. Um, if we just scroll up, we can see this is when you're copied into the email. Can you see? Yes. So you enter the chain at this point. Uh, what individuals did you have who accessed the audit log at Fujitsu? Um. The team didn't access directly to Fujitsu. They made requests for records. 
and what part of the um, security team that you led did that? Um, that would be the fraud strand, which then moved into the security operations strand. Were there any written instructions that you were aware of that told them how to do it and what to request? Um, in the early years, I can't recall, but clearly I've seen in the bundle that there was a procedure written up late on, I think, 2013. In late 2013? Uh, sorry, in the late tenure, or late part of my tenure in 2013. Was that written up um, almost at the same time that the post office stopped prosecuting? Well, that'd be about the same time, yes. So what about such a protocol for the period of time that the post office was prosecuting? I'm Were not. you aware of anything? No. Was there a menu of material that the um, people who had the function of obtaining the material from Fujitsu could look at to determine what they should seek? I have no knowledge of that sort of level of operation at all. Or what was available? I have no knowledge. I just didn't know that type of information at, at the operational level. Uh, Mr Smith continues, within Fujitsu, I believe Gareth Jenkins is the individual best to interpret the audit log, but also explain how uh, Horizon is set up to maintain integrity, both in normal running and when failures occur. Uh, Rod would have to field someone to explain the back office controls we have. I'll contact Fujitsu to make sure that Gareth or a suitably qualified alternative is, alternative is in place. I would suggest one of the big accounting firms <coughs> the best bet for an expert report. They have systems experts. There is likely to be, sorry, this is likely to be quite expensive as Horizon underwent very frequent um, change. And then scrolling up the page, please. You yourself forward the chain on to um, Sue Lowther. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, you say, uh, can you please support and advise Mandy and Co in this exercise and provide some initial thoughts. You say Sue leads on information security for the post office. What function did Sue Lowther then perform in February 2010? Don't know, can't recall. Was she um, within your department? I believe at that time, yes. Was there an <clears throat> element of your department that had as its responsibility information security? Yes, that was led by Sue Lowther. Uh, how many people were in the information security department? Um, I think there were about three or four permanent and a couple contractors. Can you recall the names of any of them? Um, Sue Lowther. Um, no, Sue Lowther was a direct report to me. I can't remember the team members underneath. And what um, function did information security perform? Um, they provided the policy standards and uh, oversight and assurance of the uh, IT within the business. Were they responsible in any way for the um, obtaining or the extraction of data? No, I don't believe they were. But, but they may have, I don't know, I, I'd have to say um, not for investigations. Um, if we go um, further up the um, page, a reply comes back to John, uh, more likely to be Dave Posnett, that will be of assistance to Mandy. And then scroll up a little bit further. You then forward the chain to um, uh, Dave Posnett. If you can support and assist Mandy in the issue described, I'll leave you to get engaged with those involved. So you're farming that out to Mr Posnett, essentially? Yeah, delegating, yes. Um, and then uh, further up the page, please. Uh, Mr. Posnett um, uh, replies, oh, we need to scroll up a little bit further. Thank you. Uh, Mandy, for info as discussed. <coughs> Essentially seeking information.
and scroll down please and scroll down again he says once I have that information I'll look to arrange a conference call do you know what happened to the um, discussion over the appointment of an independent expert from one of the big accountancy firms uh, for example or um, uh, consulting firms who had systems and IT experts within them to undertake a review? No, I can't recall. Is that because you delegated this to Mr Posnes and that was the end of it? That may be a potential, but again, I can't recall. Uh, can we uh, move forward in the um, uh, tale uh, to poll 0011 9858. Can you see this is an email, if you look at the foot of the page, from Mr. Ismay, the head of product and brand accounting, accounting to you at the top of the page, please. And Mandy Talbot. Can you see that? Yes. Dated the 24th of February. So shortly after the email uh, chain that we've just looked at. Uh, would you agree that this is um, a discussion at quite a high level within, or quite a senior level within um, the post office, head of PMBA, and head of security. Yes, we're obviously heads of our own departments. And at this time, what would your understanding of uh, Miss Talbot, Maddie Talbot's role, be in relation to the Horizon challenges? I don't recall. I don't particularly recall Mandy Talbot, to be honest. In any event, Mr. Ismay says to the pair of you further to your emails with Dave, and I think that might be a cross-reference to the Dave Posnett emails that we've just seen, which is why I showed them to you. I think we do need to get some independent heavyweight assurance to rebut the challenges. Dave's outline made sense. He suggested one of the big accounting firms I actually received a cold call proposal from Deloitte recently for exactly that work after they read the articles about Horizon in Accountancy Age <coughs> magazine. Can you recall the articles in Accountancy Age magazine? No, not in Accountancy magazine, no. When you get an email like this, what would you do? Is somebody referring to um, articles about the Horizon system in a publication that you maybe don't subscribe to, what would you do? Would you think, I better find out what that is? I can't recall. Um, if it's an accountancy magazine, I probably wouldn't have access. May speak to Rod, who does access, but I just can't recall. In any event, he says Deloitte's are engaged with group audit already uh, in a set price framework agreement. I think we should consider them. I'll speak to them in a no commitment sense. Given the existing framework deal, I don't know if we could just use them, if they fitted the bill, or whether we have another preferred supplier, or uh, whether we need more of a tender the other obvious candidates are our auditors, Ernst & Young, plus KPMG and PwC. I think it would be worth us having a three-way call. Looks like we're in workshops. Um, I think we need to understand what cases are underway in this area. And then scrolling down, um, I found out that Carol Cross in my team and John Long Longman from yours are in court soon for West Byfleet or West Byfield. This is an office who, as part of their defence, is challenging the integrity of Horizon. I didn't know if you were involved, Mandy. I think we need to be clear about all live cases so we can ensure the same consistent, robust response throughout. And based on the sensible principles of Dave's email about pinning down the exact transaction logs and talking about facts, not um, speculation. So. Would you agree that this email is starting up a conversation about two things, the um, benefit of an independent review and how to take that forwards, and separately 
the recommendations made by Mr. Smith, Dave Smith, for an approach to investigations to support the post office's position in challenges to Horizon. Yes. And the message from Mr. Ismay here is suggesting that he pushed forward the conversation about an independent audit or review with Deloitte in the first instance. Yes. Occupying the senior position that you did, was that a decision that Mr. Um, Ismay could take himself, or would it need to go off to the board or some other decision-making body for approval? Um, I would suspect it would have to go to, off to somewhere else. And the someone else being what or who? Um, I'd expect it be the executive committee at that level or higher, the board. So the executive committee or the board. And what was your role in this? Did you need to agree to or authorise his proposal to go off and um, get an expert report on Horizon from um, external, an external body? No. Could you have shut it down? Could you have said, hold on, stop? No. We, saw, we see in the email that um, in the last paragraph, um, Mr. Ismay saying um, that we need to understand what cases are underway in this area. At this time, by February 2010, was there no tracking mechanism within the post office? whether within security or more widely, that monitored the number and nature of challenges to Horizon? Not that I can recall, no. Is the um, October 2013 protocol the first attempt at such a mechanism, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, yes. Can you recall what you did as a result of um, this um, email? No, I can't recall. Can you recall whether the three-way call that he suggests happened? No, I can't recall that. And therefore you can't recall what was discussed? No. Can you recall what happened next? No. Can you recall whether there was any discussion with Fujitsu or involving Fujitsu at this stage? No, I can't recall. Can we turn forwards then um, again, please, to poll 3054371? And um, if we uh, look, please, at page three. at the foot of page three. Um, the start of this chain on the 25th of February is um, a, an email from um, Andrew Daly um, to Jason Collins and Graham Brander, blind copied to um, Andy Hayward. Can you see that? Yes. Um, Andy, and I think that's Andy Hayward in context, called me yesterday and asked whether you guys could put together some stats on these cases, um, remembering that the subject of the email was Horizon disputed cases, where the accused defence was or is that the Horizon data is unreliable for any amount of reasons uh, given by the accused. This should be sent to Ian within the next few days. He'll need as much information as um, possible. Um, again, does it follow that by this time, February 2010, there was no central repository of issues that sub-postmasters had raised with the integrity of Horizon data? Uh, not I can recall. Um, if we go back to um, the third page, please. Um, we see the reply. Thank you. Andrew, thanks for this. Uh, when completed, can you also forward details to Sue Lowther 
as she is leading on behalf of security, which I think is consistent with the email that we saw right at the beginning, um, uh, but inconsistent with then Mr. Smith saying that Dave Posnett might be the better option. Please also send Sue any additional documents or reports pertinent to specific cases, um, i.e. Jason, the forensic report from John L's case. Uh, bullet points will suffice. If more is needed, we can supply. And then further up the page, um, Graham at Brander replies, I'm aware of two ongoing cases at West Byfleet, John Long Longman and Orford Road, Lisa Allen, and also some historical cases. Um, but as FIs, is that financial investigators? I presume so, yes. Uh, we wouldn't have Horizon disputed cases other than those reported by the investigators who will have far more details on the issues than us. I've attached an article from an IT magazine which may have brought this issue to the fore in the first place, which may be of interest to Ian. And then page two, please. At the foot of the page, we see this chain being sent to you. All further out of discussion, to our discussion earlier today, additional information in the attached PDF article below, which I think is the IT magazine that's referred to. As part of the wider review, it may well be worthwhile understanding the outcome of each case of the case studies referenced where applicable, i.e. criminal, civil, that may assist in our review. And further up the page. Again, you're a little bit further, please. You're copied in on this email of the 8th of March, 2010. Um, as was discussed on the conference call and taking into account Rob's comments to confirm what we're looking at is, quote, a general due diligence exercise on the integrity of Horizon to confirm our belief in the robustness of the system and thus rebut any challenges. Uh, can you recall discussion at this time about the need to seek a general due diligence exercise, the purpose of which was to confirm uh, the post office's belief in the robustness of the Horizon system? No, I don't recall. Wouldn't you think the better question would be, we're looking for a due diligence exercise on the integrity of Horizon to see whether it is robust or not? Yes. Rather than to confirm our pre-existing beliefs? Yes. The information security team have looked at the information that's been forwarded to them read the above, and it seems that the issues raised are mainly around procedural items and about accounting reconciliation. And then there's some um, requests. And then over to the first page, please. Uh, scroll up, please. A little bit more to Mr. King's email. Um, Rob, thanks for your time earlier. Uh, he copies in Rob Wilson, the head of criminal law in the post office. As discussed, I can confirm we're in no way questioning investigating the financial integrity of Horizon or of the accounting system as a whole. Can you um, help us how Mr. King came to the view that an independent expert report into the integrity of the Horizon system would be in no way questioning or investigating the financial integrity of Horizon? No, I can't comment on what Dave King was thinking. It, isn't this redolent of a mindset within the post office at this time? that we're not actually looking to find out whether there's something wrong with the system. We only want to hear that there's nothing wrong with the system. That's not how I recall it, no. But why don't we see in a single email it put in that rather neutral and open way? Why are all of the emails written? We want a report that will confirm our existing beliefs that it's robust we're not going to question or investigate the integrity of Horizon. 
Why are they all written the wrong way round? I can't explain that. Well, is it because, is this the simple truth, that they accurately reflect the mindset of the day? I can't recall. I don't... Uh, I can't recall it being like that, but no. If everyone did have an open mind, wouldn't we see that written across these pages that I keep showing you? Um, yes, I'd say so. And does its absence from any of the pages that we're going to look at and we have looked at mean that there wasn't that open mind to the possibility of Horizon lacking integrity? I don't recall it as that being at the time, but clearly, with hindsight, um, it shows a different um, picture. Why does it take hindsight? I'm asking you about contemporaneous material that all seems to point in one direction. A group of people looking to stand the system up, not a group of people with open minds looking genuinely to inquire whether their system works or not. It doesn't take hindsight. This is just a reflection of the values of the day, isn't it, Mr Scott? It's not what I recall, no. At this time, that can come down, thank you. Uh, that's late February 2010. What did you know about bugs, errors and defects in legacy Horizon, the old Horizon, before it became Horizon Online? Uh, I wasn't aware of any bugs, issues or defects that impacted uh, investigations. Would you agree that if there were bugs, errors and defects in Horizon, in particular if they affected the integrity and reliability of the financial data produced by Horizon, you should have been aware of them? Yes. Were you actually keen to find such information or did you close your eyes to it? No, I would always be open to understand whether there's any issues with it and whether anything needed to be examined. By this time, it seems from the email exchange, there would be a sufficient number of Horizon disputed cases to be able to compile statistics of them. So a number of them, yes? If that were the case, but why had no effort been made previously to compile a clear picture of how often and why the system was challenged by accused sub-postmasters? I can't explain why it wasn't. Again, is that because the principle that operated was least said, soonest mended? No. Can we turn, please, to poll 0010? 6867. And can we start with page three, please? Just give me a moment to catch up with my hard copy papers. Um, if we scroll down, please, we can see a message um, from um, Mr. Hayward to a number of senior people at the post office, including um, Rod Ismay, um, David X. Smith, and you. Yes, I'm CCD. Uh, can you help us with some of the others on this distribution list? Um, Rebecca Mantle. No. Um, Ian Murphy. He was a senior security manager, head of fraud at that time, I believe. And so within your area of responsibility, within your department? Yeah. And so we can see this is sent at um, one minute past five on the 26th of uh, February. And so this is after the previous message that we had seen Mr. Ismay had sent to you, 
and Randy Talbert, suggesting Deloitte as a, a possibility. Yes? Um, he says, following our conference call today, below is a brief summary of the agreed key activities to progress the next step in relation to the above piece of work. Uh, the heading is Challenges to Horizon. Um, AH and MT, can you help us with who AH might be in that context? Him, uh, Andy Haywood. Yeah. And Mandy Talbot to provide um, SL and DK. Um, SL? I'm, we'll make a presumption that's Sue Lowther. And um, at DK? Uh, Dave King. With information on past and present cases with reference to the Horizon Challenge, criminal and civil cases. Note I've asked the fraud team to review approximately two, uh, sorry, the past two to three years case file, although these challenges are of a more recent nature. Do you know why the review was to be of the past two to three years of case files? Why it was, why it was limited to about 2007, 2008 to 2010? No, I don't recall. Rather than going back to when the prosecutions commenced in 2000 in reliance on Horizon? No, I don't recall. And presumably, I mean, we've seen, we will see in a moment your um, contributions to this chain. You didn't say at the time, hold on, haven't we been prosecuting for 10 years on the basis of Horizon? Uh, why are we only looking at two to three years? Why not? I don't recall why. He continues um, in paragraph um, three, um, subject to agreement of two above, conduct full investigations into integrity issues with conclusion stroke report provided. Once investigations and conclusions drawn, gain external verification to give a level of, quote, external gravitas to the response to these challenges. Recommend Ernst & Young <coughs> as most suitable partner to complete this um, to be um, advised. And so this was setting out a plan to investigate the challenges to horizon integrity, yes? Yes. And at first, the investigation was going to be an external one, yes? That was the plan? Yes. It was going to reach conclusions, yes? Sorry. And only then was there to be an independent review by somebody outside the organisation, potentially Ernst and Young. Yes, yeah, sorry, the witness nodded his head just now. I was just asking for a verbal answer. Okay, I can't hear that, but I think either I was overspeaking the witness or the witness was nodding rather than. Um, giving an oral answer. Can you, um, when you um, wish to give a non-verbal communication, i.e. shaking your head, nodding, um, this morning you put your hands up, um, explain what you mean in words so that the stenographer can type them into the record, please. Okay. Sorry? Yes, so the question was the independent investigation was going to reach conclusions and then it was going to be referred to an outside organization to quote give a level of external gravitas to it yes it seems by this stage that ernst and young were to be recognized uh, were to be recommended as most suitable and mr ismay's um, suggestion earlier in the day that deloitte's were going to be contacted has um, fallen by the wayside, doesn't it? Uh, from this, it appears so. Was there sufficient concern within your team to consider that the challenges to Horizon needed to be explored, investigated, and then conclusions drawn? Um, I don't recall, but there's indication here, isn't there? and sufficient concern that any conclusions should be accompanied by a level of external oversight? Yes. Given um, members of your team were acting as investigators 
in Horizon cases and as the prosecuting authority for the post office. Was that something of a significant concern to you? I can't recall. Well, help us. Looking at this now, do you think it would be a significant concern to you? Um, yes. It would be important to appreciate whether there were or were not integrity issues with Horizon. Yes. Both to appreciate whether you could continue with the existing investigations and prosecutions, agreed? Yes. And to consider whether you may have any duties in respect of uh, cases where convictions had already been secured? Yes. Did that independent um, uh, review ever happen? Uh, as far as I recall, no. Did the internal investigation that has been mentioned here in the way that's described here ever happen? Um, I don't recall. I, I don't know whether it was conducted or not, and I wasn't aware. Are you aware of anyone intervening to prevent it from happening? No. Further up the page, please. Keep going, please. And a foot of the... Um, in fact, we can't because it'll be a blank page. We see here the end of an email signed off by Dave Posnitz, yes? And yes. if we can go to the foot of page one, please. To miss out the blank page. Thank you. We can see at the foot of the page... <coughs> Um, Dave Posnett, I think same um, distribution list, but I think um, Rob Wilson has been added now. Uh, or can we ensure that Rob Wilson, head of criminal law, is kept appraised of the situation and included in any further meetings or updates? Our prosecution cases have faced an increased challenge as well as our civil cases. So the activities outlined below and indeed going forward are applicable to both legal teams. And then if we scroll up to the top of page one, please, we'll find an email. Thank you. to a number of people on the distribution list, but you seem to have been excluded. Can you see that? Yes, I think I was excluded on the one below. Um, if we just scroll down, please. Yes, I think you're right. D Dave Posnitz has cut you out. And then uh, if we go back to Mr. Wilson's um, reply to Dave Posnett of your team. Um, he, Mr. Wilson says, if it's thought there is a difficulty with Horizon, then clearly the action set out in your memo is not only needed but imperative. The consequence, however, will be that to commence or to continue to proceed with any criminal proceedings will be inappropriate. My understanding is that the integrity of Horizon data is sound, and it's as a result of that this, that persistent challenges that have been made in court have always failed. These challenges are not new and have been dealt with us since the inception of Horizon, as it's always been the only way that defendants are left to challenge our evidence when they've stolen money or where they need to show that our figures are not correct. What's being suggested is an internal investigation is conducted. Such an investigation will be disclosable as undermining evidence on the defence in the cases proceeding through the criminal courts. Inevitably, the defence will argue that if we're carrying out an investigation, we clearly do not have confidence in Horizon, and therefore to continue to prosecute will be an abuse of the criminal process. Alternatively, we could be asked to stay the proceedings pending the outcome of the investigation. If this were to be adopted, 
the resultant adverse publicity to, could lead to massive difficulties for poll, as it will be seen by the press and media to vindicate the current challenges. The potential impact, however, is much wider for the post office in that every country, sorry, every office in the country will be seen to be operating a compromised system with untold damage to the business. Our only real alternative to avoid the adverse publicity will be to offer no evidence on each of our criminal cases. This should mitigate some adverse publicity, but is not a total guarantee. To continue protect prosecuting alleged offenders, knowing that there is an ongoing problem, sorry, an ongoing investigation to determine <coughs> the veracity of Horizon could also be detrimental to the reputation of my team. <coughs> if we were to secure convictions in the knowledge that there was an investigation where the investigation established a difficulty with the system, we would be open to criticism and appeal to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal will inevitably be highly critical of any prosecutor's decision to proceed against defendants in the knowledge there could be an issue with the evidence. What we really need to do is impress on Fujitsu the importance of fully cooperating in the provision of technical expertise and witness statements to support the criminal and civil litigation now and in the future. Uh, given the nature of the discussions that took place on the 26th of February, I'm staggered I was not invited to take part in the conference. Do you read this as Mr. Wilson saying, if there is a basis to investigate problems, we better get on and do it? Or is he saying, if we get on and investigate, we'll be in serious trouble if we do? It does come across like that, yes. The latter? Yes. So he wasn't saying there's an imperative to investigate. He's saying we simply can't question Horizon because it's got all of these adverse consequences. Um, I think it's for Rob Wilson to give his interpretation of what he was trying to say. But Mr um, Scott, you had been um, the subject of a number of discussions and um, email exchanges about the need to conduct an independent investigation, mm -hmm. um, either by getting in external consultants or by the post office itself conducting an internal investigation and sending the conclusions to an external body for external gravitas. You must have wanted to know what happened to those two proposals. I can't recall. Did you not say, hold on, one moment we were going to investigate the entire basis on which we prosecuted a whole cohort of people, some of whom have gone to prison, and the next minute we're not. <laughs> What's happened between A and B? I'm sorry, I just can't recall what was happening. And you were also responsible for uh, Mr. Posnett and Mr. Um, uh, Hayward and Mr. King, addressees to this email? Yes. Did none of them come back to you and say, boss, the whole thing has had the brakes put on it because this lawyer has got involved and the lawyer who staggered that he wasn't um, included in an earlier meeting is now saying we can't do this because it might generate adverse publicity to the organisation. Sorry, I can't recall them coming to me to say that. Would you agree that objectively, if there was any concern about the integrity of Horizon, the right thing to do was to conduct a full inquiry as an imperative? Yes, if there was doubt over its integrity, yes. Had that been the plan of the senior team members involved in the earlier te telephone conference until Mr Wilson's input? That appears to be the case. Was the effect of Mr Wilson's input to shut down any internal or external substantive examination of the integrity of Horizon? Um, I can't recall this email because obviously I didn't see it. So. I don't know what the, he was actually trying to achieve, whether he was actually trying to achieve that or not. But Mr Scott, we've seen that you were involved in a number of discussions up until yes. now that were on, if not um, train tracks, um, heading in a direction. And as you've agreed, neither of the things ever happened. Were you not curious at the time why 
uh, the two alternative plans were not seen through to completion. No, sorry, I can't recall. Was there a concern, as expressed in this email here, an overriding concern in the post office to avoid adverse publicity for the business? Um, I think all businesses want to avoid adverse publicity. Did anyone mention what might be in the other hand? Adverse publicity on the one hand, and on the other, we've prosecuted hundreds of people. Many of them have gone to prison. We might have done so on the basis of data that lacked integrity. Let's weigh them up. I don't recall such conversations. Was there ever an other hand? A, hold on, there might just be a problem with the integrity of Horizon here. People may have been convicted on the basis of unsound data. We need to do something about it. Uh, I can't recall. I would expect the lawyers to have uh, shouted. The recipients of this email, at least, would have been aware, because the email says so, that the challenges to Horizon are not new and have been with us since the inception of Horizon. Did you, you know that, that the challenges to Horizon had been there right from the start, right back to 2000? I don't recall that. When you became head of security, did anyone brief you to say, look, boss, we prosecute people on the basis of data that's produced by this system called Horizon. For the past seven years, there have been a myriad of complaints about the reliability of the data it produces. Don't recall that. So I wonder whether that's an appropriate moment to take the afternoon break. Yep, by all means. Um, so call um, pass, please. Very well. Thank you very much. You uh, see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scott, we've um, seen a series of emails in which um, various members of the post office express their confidence in the integrity of Horizon and the data produced by it. If you had been aware by um, uh, 2010 that Fujitsu had got concerns uh, from the outset, from the national rollout in 99 to 2000, that the EPOS system, the electronic point of sale system, at the heart of Horizon might require a rewrite or a design might that have impacted upon your confidence? If I'd known that, uh, then yes. If you've been aware of a series of bugs, errors and defects being identified in Horizon, including some which could impact upon discrepancies and balancing, would that have impacted upon your confidence in Horizon? If I'd known, yes. Uh, can we turn forwards, please, to... Um, Poll 0479-0479. Now, um, if we look at the... Um, foot of the page first. We can see Mr. Ismay um, distributing uh, a document called Horizon Challenges Draft Report. Yes, and you're not included on that? Yes. And then if we go up, please, and a bit more, we can see Mr. Ismay sending it to a wider collection of people including Mandy Talbot, um, Rob Wilson, 
and Sue Lowther. Was anyone um, in that list within your department? Yes. Other than Sue Lowther? Yes. Uh, who else? Uh, Dave Pardine. Yes, of course. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, no. He, Mr Ismay, says, Dear all, latest version incorporating, as best I can manage, all the input you have made. Uh, did you know in um, mid-2010 that um, members of your department were providing input into a report written by Rod Ismay about Horizon Challenges? Sorry, I can't recall where I did. He says, um, thanks for your time and comments in the last couple of days. This is a complex area, and I'd value further comments you have. Realistically, they've got to be by lunch tomorrow, etc. Regardless of how this document is finalised, there are a number of improvement points we'll need to work on together. And then this, the priority should probably be to provide any input considered appropriate for closing down the issues that cause Channel 4 to consider this a news item, also to ensure we're prepared for the next court cases. Now, you're not included on this email, but I want to ask you about that last paragraph and the sentiments included um, in it. Did that reflect the prevailing mood in the senior levels of the post office at the time, that the priority was to close down any issues that the media considered to be newsworthy? Um, <clears throat> on the basis that everyone was being told that the system was robust and reliable, um, I guess that was one of the areas that they were looking at. What investigation had taken place to establish whether or not the system was reliable? I don't know. How were people uh, um, allowed to convince themselves that the system was reliable? if an investigation hadn't taken place? Sorry, I don't know. But again, did this, um, what we see written here, to a wide range of people, including members of your department, reflect the culture and values of the post office at the time? That the priority, the main thing, should be to close down issues that cause in this case, Channel 4, to consider this to be a news item? No, I think on the basis that everyone's been told the system is robust and reliable, then that's why they're looking to change the adverse media. To your knowledge, did anyone ever put their hand up and say, hold on, actually the priority is to see if there's a problem with Horizon? Um, I can't recall, but it may have easily been. Well, actually, the priority, I'm sorry to have to raise this, everyone, the priority is actually to see whether we sent anyone to prison that shouldn't have gone to prison. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, I can't recall. The priority is to establish whether anyone innocent has been convicted on the basis of data that's unreliable. That's the priority. Did anyone ever say that to your knowledge? No, I don't recall that. Ever been in a meeting where anyone raised that point? I can't recall that. Have you seen any email where anyone raised that point? Our priority should be our postmasters and whether any innocent men and women have been sent to prison. Sorry, I just can't recall that. No. Can we move forward to the Ismay report itself? 2nd of August 2010. Um, poll 3029475. Um, this is a copy of the um, Ismay report itself. And we can see it's dated the 2nd of August. And uh, you'll see that you're a named recipient of it. Yes. Can we go forwards, please, to page 19? And look at the um, bottom half of the page. Um, independent review and audit angles. Mr Ismay says, the post office has actively considered the merits of an independent 
review. This has been purely from the perspective that we believe in Horizon, but that a review could help give others the same confidence that we have. To your recollection, was that the frame of reference for any consideration of an independent review? Um, I can't recall. It may have been. I can't recall. I, we're not actually going to look to see whether there's anything wrong with the system. We're only going to look at it because we believe the system is robust and we need to convince others. There was the belief that the system was robust and reliable. He continues, our discussion between IT, legal, product and branch accounting, security and the press office has continued to be that no matter what opinions we obtain, people will still ask what if, and that the defence will always ask questions that require answers beyond the report. Further, such a report would only have merit as at the date of creation, and would have to be updated at the point at which Horizon or the numerous component platforms are upgraded. You see it says our discussion between, amongst others, security. Did that uh, discussion Sorry, Mr. Beer, it's decision. Quite right. Our decision between, amongst others, security has be, continued to be that no matter what opinions we obtain, etc. Was that decision one to which you were a party? Um, I don't recall. It's most likely I'd have delegated that down to the people involved in the draft report. Were you party to any discussions or decision-making process that the press office contributed to? Sorry, can you uh, yes. a bit more clarity? Were you a party to any discussion or decision-making process to which the press office was a party? Uh, not that I recall. Mr Ismay gives us a reason for not seeking independent review, that such a report would only have merit as at the date of creation and would have to be updated. Would you agree that that's true of um, all reports that are seeking to assess the reliability of, for example, a computer system? Um. I guess there's an element to that, but I'd say that a report wouldn't last. It, it has more than just the date of the creation, I'd say. Well, in this case, at 2010, it had the ability to look 10 years backwards, hadn't it? Wouldn't that be a, a value in itself? Yes. And so how do you understand the um, expression of a reason for not getting an independent review, that the report would only have merit at the date of its creation? Um, I can't say I'd agree with that. No. But is it a bit worse than that? It's palpably weak as a reason. Um, no, I think it doesn't... Uh, doing a review over 10 years, that, that is worthwhile, because then you flush everything out. He says, Ernst and Young and Deloitte are both aware of the issue from the media. We've discussed the pros and cons of the report with them. Both would propose significant caveats and would have limits on their ability to stand in court. We've not pursued this um, further. Do you know what the caveats that um, Ernst and Young and Deloitte said that they would um, have to make? No, sorry, I don't even recall being in any of those conversations. Do you know why external um, auditors or experts would have difficulty in standing in court and speaking to their report? No. Over the page, please. It's al also important, says Mr um, Ismay, to be crystal clear about any review if one were commissioned. 
any investigation would need to be disclosed in court. Although we will be doing the review to comfort others, any perception that poll, the post office doubts its own systems would mean that all criminal prosecutions would have to be stayed. It would also beg a question for the Court of Appeal over past prosecutions and imprisonments. When you um, received this report, did you understand that a reason for not getting outside experts in is that the product of their work may have to be disclosed in court proceedings? Um, I don't actually recall this document from back then, and I think I saw Rob Wilson's name on it. So I think that would have been covered off by Rob Wilson. What do you think of it now as a reason not to get an independent expert report, that it might uncover things that you have to disclose in court as a reason for not going and getting an independent expert report? It's not. I'm sorry? It's not. It's not a good reason, is it? No. And so when you get this report, presumably you read it? Uh, almost certainly, I would have thought so. Wouldn't these things strike you? Hold on, the reasoning here is um, paper thin for not getting an expert report. Why aren't we doing this? Um, I can't recall, although knowing that Rob Wilson's on the circulation as head of criminal law, I'd have expected him to have responded. Well, indeed, that appears to be uh, a reflection or a summary of the Rob Wilson advice, doesn't it? Yes, which I didn't see. I wasn't on that email. The, um, the warning shot, be careful what you wish for. If you go and get an expert report, you might have to disclose it in criminal proceedings. That's essentially what's saying here, being said here. Again, is the absence of any kickback or uh, reaction to this by you or indeed others symptomatic of the fact that you like what this report said? We don't need to go and get independent expert evidence. We've got our guy, Rod Ismay, to say that everything's fine. Let the caravan move on. Was that the prevailing attitude at the time? Sorry, I, no, I just don't recall it as that. Can we go back to page one, please? Uh, halfway down, please. <coughs> he says this paper has been compiled as an objective internal review. Did you know what Mr Ismay's terms of reference were? Uh, I don't recall. And Probably I wouldn't have known if I've just received that and not been involved in the draft. He has told um, the chairman on his oath that his terms of reference were only to look for and to include evidence that supported the integrity of Horizon, to not be objective and not include any material that undermined the integrity of Horizon. Did you know that? No. So what did you do with this report when you got it? Um, I don't recall what I did with the report, to be honest. Did you issue any instructions about the necessity of disclosure of it in any criminal proceedings? Uh, I don't recall. Were I you aware of any criminal proceedings in which it was disclosed? Uh, no, I don't recall that. Uh, can we um, turn to a new topic, please? That can come down. Um, your role in horizon integrity cases. Um, can we turn up paragraphs um, 20 to 26 of your first witness statement, please? So that's WITN 0389-0100. And paragraph um, 20 starts on page seven. Uh, between paragraphs 20 and 26, you tell us about your um, role as head of security. You tell us in 20 there were a range of serious issues that required your attention. 
in 22, uh, 21 and 22, you tell us about physical threats and uh, um, attacks on sub-postmasters. And then over the page to 20, um, paragraph 23, uh, you carry on uh, talking about physical threats. And on 24, you say that on taking up the role, I brought with me a personal interest in information gathering and data intelligence to identify and drive down losses. You were keen to drive the compilation and analysis of poll information across the security business. Your ethos was one of loss prevention rather than being reactive. That's essentially what you told us first thing uh, this morning. Yes. Um, in 25, over the page please, on page nine, <coughs> Um, in the third line, you say you commissioned Detica, a subsidiary of BAE Systems, to conduct an initial review of post offices' systems with a loss and fraud uh, di di digitalization goal in mind. And then over the page at 26, you say, to summarize, my role as head of security was multifaceted which, um, amongst other things, required me to manage sensitive and demanding situations, travel frequently, and oversee large, uh, various large and complex projects. Yes. Um, in those paragraphs, uh, you appear to suggest that your knowledge of um, the day-to-day -day activities of your staff was limited. Would that be right? Yes, I operated more strategically and left that to the heads of the respective strands. If we go back to page six, please. You tell us in paragraph 18, um, second sentence, I was informed by my predecessor, Tony Marsh, that the fraud team was well established, that the investigative framework was effective and running well and that the investigators were proficient in their role and able to effectively organize and run investigations. Uh, that was also my experience. And then about 10 lines on, um, I was not involved in carrying out or overseeing criminal investigations on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the last line, uh, to an extent, the fraud team ran itself. Yes. Does it follow that you did not have oversight of, and therefore no responsibility for, the actions of some of those under your command who had a part in the prosecution of sub-postmasters? I was the head of security, so overall um, in charge, but the day-to-day -day operations was managed by the respective heads of uh, the respective strands. And so would you put it this way, that although you might have theoretical accountability for the actions of some of them who were operating under your command, in fact, you got no factual responsibility for what they did or failed to do? No, overall, as head of security, ultimately, um, it comes up to me if anything gets escalated or reported to me, or it's not working in the correct fashion. Uh, but the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the operations and the teams was uh, delegated to the heads of, of the strands. But as a matter of fact, you didn't have oversight of and um, responsibility for their actions? Not on a day-to-day -day basis. Was therefore the security department structured in a way that meant that you had no proper oversight of what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, no, I did have uh, formal meetings, one-to-ones with the heads of, uh, and if we're talking about the fraud and security operations, um, so we did meet um, on formal one-to-ones. They'd also have a formal security lead team meeting on a monthly basis where things were raised and et cetera. 
If we uh, go forward to page 16 of your witness statement. And look at paragraph 43. You say the fraud strand senior management and team leaders were responsible for the conduct of investigations along with the investigators as explained by, uh, in paragraph 18, which I've just taken to you, uh, taken you to, I was told by my predecessor that the investigators in the team were experienced, and I understood they were well-versed in investigative processes. I therefore assume that it would have been the investigators themselves who decide how a criminal investigation would be conducted, applying the relevant policies as appropriate. Did you ever... Um, think to question that or did you proceed on the assumption that you set out in set out you assumed that everyone was doing things correctly they were well versed in investigative processes they would decide how to conduct a criminal investigation and therefore you didn't involve yourself in it no so as I said I did meet up with the um, head of the fraud strand and security operations. I'd meet with <coughs> lawyers as well and have discussions around uh, the performance and proficiency of the cases and case files and the evidence. Um, I even travelled to Scotland and Northern Ireland once to see our external criminal lawyers and they gave me uh, comfort that all was um, appropriate and correct. So there was a number of different... Um, channels that I was looking at. In um, his witness statement, I'll um, give the reference, no need to bring it up. It's WITN 0816-0100 at paragraph 47. Uh, Mr. Haywood of your department said that he was made aware of issues raised regarding Horizon integrity, although he had no direct involvement in dealing with them. This was being led by others within the business. With regard to the security team, updates were provided by the head of security, JS. In summary, these being that the Horizon integrity issues were being reviewed. JS also requested that all case files were passed to him for personal review. Are you the JS that Mr. Mm. Hayward is referring to there? Potentially, what year? Well, he refers to, um, I'm not sure this will be on the system, but poll treble zero nine double five four seven. No, not on the system. I believe it's 2011. So he refers to a document in the introduction to that yep. paragraph and say, with regard to this document, I say as follows. I believe that's 2011. I think you say in your first witness statement it was only in 2013, and in your second witness statement you say, I've been shown some more documents, and you think that it was 2012. Ah, so that's different, talking about different things there then. Okay. So if you're talking 2011, I do not recall... Um, case files being sent to me uh, because you'd be talking to, they had about two, three hundred on the go at any one point and I can't recall receiving two, three hundred case files. In terms of 2012, 2013 that you just mentioned is around being asked by my line manager Susan Crichton to take on the role of decision maker for prosecution um, so that would be some point in 2012 most likely the separation with uh, triggered that but I believe now looking at documents that would have ceased mid 2013. In terms of all the case papers in my statement uh, what I have said is that I initiated then a monthly review meeting for the investigation and prosecution status uh, which all the cases were reviewed and at that meeting I had Cartwright King solicitors uh, in the meeting as well. 
So in summary then, when did you first take over the responsibility for decision making on whether there should be a prosecution or not? So I believe now it's around about 2012. What was the um, instigation or the, uh, the reason for you taking that over? Um, I can't recall. It may have been um, the separation of Royal Mail Group. Why would the separation from RMG have necessitated you taking over that function? Um, I don't know. I remember speaking to Susan Crichton as to whether we will continue with prosecutions or not uh, in separation, because I needed to know whether to, how to manage and structure the team, and it may have been instigated from that discussion, but I can't recall. In your um, witness statement, if we look at um, page six, please. At the foot of the page, page 19. You say, my remit in respect of investigations did slightly change towards the end of 2013, and that's what you've corrected to 2012. Yeah. When I was asked by my line manager at the time, um, Susan Crichton, to review and sign off on any new investigation files, what do you mean by sign off? That, gives, that may give the impression that if you sign off on something, that you are merely endorsing that which has already been decided. Um. Well, I obviously am signing to say that we will continue progressing to a prosecution. We will continue to progress, or we, um, I authorise the institution of criminal proceedings? Um, I guess it will be authorised. Again, it's the, the language that you've used in appreciating this is 10 years on. Yeah. Did your um, understanding of your function amount to you signing off on a decision that had already been made by the lawyers? Uh, I believe so, yes. So to what extent did you review the underlying material? Um, I would have uh, reviewed it. If it was um, case papers, I've gone through all the case papers. Um, Sorry, can you just say this again? I missed what you said there. Yeah, if the case papers were sent to me, um, I'd have read all the case papers, including the suspect offender report, the Tate summary, um, any other sort of material, and obviously the legal advice. Did it always consist of all of that material, or sometimes did you just get offender report plus legal advice? Uh, I can't recall. I think it was more, generally always more stuff, to be honest. In the course of um, reviewing those cases for prosecution, can you recall uh, asking for inquiries to be made or investigations being undertaken in the light of what we've seen happen in 2010 and 2011 about horizon integrity issues for those questions to be actively uh, considered in the investigations that you were signing off for prosecution? I can't recall saying that or doing that. But why not? I can't recall whether I did or didn't. You think you might have asked for statements proving the integrity of Horizon? On that, uh, most likely not. I don't recall doing that. Can I turn to um, a separate topic that can come down? Thank you. Um, your role in reporting to the board. Uh, did you report to the board? I don't recall reporting to the board, RMG or post office. Did you report to um, the Risk and Compliance Committee? Yes. And what was your understanding of what the Risk and Compliance Committee's function was? Uh, to provide oversight from a risk and compliance perspective of post office. And how frequently did you attend upon the Risk and Compliance Committee? Um, 
I don't think I was quorum. Um, I believe I was a member and attended as a when. Um, I can't recall. They varied throughout the 10 years, so I can't recall whether they're monthly or quarterly. And that may have changed throughout the 10 years. Uh, can we look, please, at um, an example of um, attendance? Poll 302, 1422. Thank you, Frenish. We can just um, expand that. It, it's the first page's landscape. Thank you. Um, the chairman was um, Peter Corbett. We can see the attendees, uh, Paula Venels, you, and David Pardo, um, <coughs> Secretariat. Was that... Um, the same person that became part of security? Sorry, yes, he was security. And was he security at this time? Yes. So security provided the secretariat function for the Risk and Compliance Committee? Looking at that, yes. And can you recall how frequently the Risk and Compliance Committee met? Uh, no, it would either be monthly or quarterly. I'm sorry? It, it, no, I can't recall exactly, but it'll either be monthly or quarterly. We haven't got a complete set, I think, of the minutes to be able to see um, with precision how uh, frequently um, it, it met. And what would determine whether you attended or not? Um, at this particular time? Yes. Yes. Um, so this is a year into, also into yeah. your role? Um, so I suspect I would be attending them all at that stage. You would expect? To be attending them all at that stage. Uh, can we look as an example of the kind of contributions you made at page eight, please? And scroll down, please. Uh, you're recorded as telling the committee that, that you planned to see your team lead an initiative on further reducing Crown losses, 2008-9, by at least 25%. You were pleased to see that consideration was being given to renewed focus in this area. <coughs> Keith Woolard, can you remember what his function was? I think he was head of compliance concurred and expanded on option one by saying that this could well see a first quarter blitz on the Crown Estate. Was this a, um, a theme at this time, 2008, early 2008, to seek to um, reduce losses from both the Crown Estate and from sub-postmasters? Yes. And was um, investigation and prosecution, including the use of confiscation proceedings, the means by which that was to be done? No. I was taking a very much preventative approach and putting in other uh, mechanisms or programmes in which to drive up compliance. And so the blitz here is a preventative blitz. Yes not a prosecution blitz? Preventative. How would you preventatively blitz Crown officers? I can't exactly recall, but I imagine we would have done analysis to see where recorded losses are happening in the Crowns, and there would have been interventions, whether directly um, training, um, comms, etc. Uh, can we look, please, at poll double O, sorry, treble O three, one three two two. Uh, 
this is a report of the Risk Com and Compliance Committee from the following year, or a report, I think, to the Risk and Compliance Committee um, of the following year. You can see that by now it records the members on um, the one hand and then other attendees on the other, and you're listed as an other attendee. Does that mean that by this time you weren't a standing member? By the looks of this, yes. And um, I just want to pick up a couple of um, pieces of information given here. Can we look at um, slide 15, please, page 15? Uh, this slide gives um, diagrammatic explanations of asset recovery against fraud. The commentary being for all closed cases um, the year-to-date figure is £237,000 recovered against identified losses of £360,000 and the current year-to-date figure for recoveries is 66%. And then in the explanation below, it said that the security team currently has 56 cases on hand with a total loss of £4.8 million being investigated under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Through the provisions of the Proceeds of Crime Act uh, legislation, the security team continue to robustly restrain identified assets. This has resulted in significant funds being recovered when cases are progressed to confiscation that may otherwise have been dissipated. And then an example is given of a case at Kingston Crown Court, a confiscation order of £43,600 was set, this being the available amount from assets identified, of which £21,500 in cash had been restrained in various bank accounts. The post office was awarded the full amount in compensation. A total benefit from crime figure was set at £99,400. The initial investigation loss was £73,000. Does... Um, at this report show that uh, seizing money through confiscation proceedings from sub-postmasters and Crown Office agents was still an important element of your investigative and prosecutorial strategy? It was, it was an established team that when I took over, and it was a requirement for me to continue, but yes, that's what that team was there for, was asset recovery when someone's been convicted at court. And the figures there in that last case, um, a total benefit from crime figure was £99,000, but the loss was only £73,000. Yes. Was that quite common, that the benefit from crime figure was assessed to be greater than the amount that the post office had lost? Um, obviously, I can see that there. Um, so I did have an escalation in regards to an increase, um, went and reviewed it with the FIU team, found that they had added um, the, the calculation that was more than a loss, and at that point I put an instruction to say uh, you only claim what was actually stolen and proven at court. Was the Risk and Compliance Committee your route as the head of the security team um, into uh, reporting issues into the board, essentially? Um, essentially, that's where I reported into, whether that went into the board or Exco. I'm not too sure which way it went. Uh, who was your direct um, report as head of security? To whom did you report directly? Uh, so over the period, it was Rick Francis, Mike Young, Susan Crichton, Chris Ujard, Jane McLeod. And so for a period it was general counsel? Uh, from around about 2010, 2011 until I left the post office. Uh, thank you very much. If you just give me one moment, I'll check my notes.
Yes, one set of last questions, um, please. If we can turn up um, page 73 of your witness statement. And which is on page 26. Um, you say in paragraph 73 at the foot of the page, uh, the inquiry has asked me to consider the following policies and explain my role in their development. And you then list 13 policies that we asked you to look at. You say, I don't recall these policies and had no role in their development, including those that list me as an owner or assurer, such as um, poll 30-0350. Any policies on prosecution would have been decided by RMG prior to separation and post-separation by the poll board and the legal team. Can we just look at one of those? I'm not going to go through all 13. Um, the one that you list, poll 303-0580. Um, this is a policy of um, April 2010, and so it's three years after you took up the uh, role as head of security, and it's about fraud investigation and prosecution. And can you see that it says the owner of the policy is you? Yes. And if we scroll down, please. It says the assurance of the policy was given by you. Yes? Well, it's not dated. In what respect is it not dated? As in me actually saying it's assured and dated as and when I did it. I see. So on the right-hand column. Yes. And also, I'm not too sure I'd have been able to sign it off because Royal Mail Group was the group parent and it's their prosecution policy that was the overarching one. And would you make the similar comment for it being authorised by you? Uh, the, the, the sentence underneath? Authorised Head yes. of Security, Post yes. Office Limited. Yes. And so, essentially, you're being verbaled up on this policy here, aren't you? You're being, you, you're, it's being said that you own it, you assured it, and you authorised it. I can't recall it. Um, I can't recall seeing it bef before, so I'm not too sure what its existence is there for. And if I showed you a number of other policies where you're the owner, you gave assurance, you'd say the same thing, would you? Um, some of them, I can see, have been my name put on as for the seniority of the head of. Um, but I wasn't into policy writing. That would be someone else. Was it common practice within the post office to list the wrong person as being the owner of a policy, the wrong person for assuring a policy, and the wrong person for authorising a policy? No, I, I'm not... Well, I don't recall this because there's no date and I'm not too sure I would have signed it off because it's a Royal Mail Group overarching prosecution policy. Post Office couldn't have its own prosecution policy. And so whoever's written this has wrongly included your name. There should be um, one or two or three different names on here. Um, well, it shouldn't have been written because the Royal Mail Group pol prosecution policy should be in existence, but potentially, yes. And again, was that a common thing, that people who owned policies were um, uh, not listed on them, but the wrong person was? Uh, not that I recall. I mean, if this is still in draft, then it's not gone to live. You say this is still in draft? Uh, it may be, because there's no date. And so in order to show that this um, was a, um, a policy that was extant, you would want, in that right-hand column, would you, two dates against assurance and authorised? In principle, yes. You say in principle, you mean actually yes? Yes. And so does it follow that um, we shouldn't rely on any policy as being that of the post office unless it has got a date against um, all relevant boxes of owner assurance and 
authorisation? It gives more evidence to say that actually it's been approved, it's been assured, and it therefore gone live. Without a date, it puts it into doubt. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Scott. I think there's um, one set of questions um, from the uh, Hodge Jones and Allen representative, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Scott, I represent a group of sub postmasters. Hello. I represent a group of sub postmasters, including Seema Misra. Um, you were taken to a email earlier on um, just to help us with the questions on it and to ask some other questions on it. I'll ask that it's brought up. It's poll 2011-9858. If we can uh, go down to the final paragraph in that email and just refresh your memory of it. It says, I found out today, this is the email from Rod Ismay, which um, was dealing with whether there should be an independent report on um, Horizon in 2010. But he also says here at the end, I found out today that Carol Cross in my team and John Longman from yours are in court soon for West Byfleet. Um, this is apparently an office who, as part of their defense, is challenging the integrity of Horizon. So that raises uh, the trial that was, um, became quite well known, uh, and you're obviously finding out about it here in, uh, in mid-2010, yes? Did you know anything about it before then? No, I don't recall, and it's obviously only mentioned it by uh, the post office name. Yes, uh, well, he goes on to say um, after asking Mandy whether she's involved, he says, I think we need to be clear about all live cases so that we ensure that sa the same consistent, robust response throughout and based on the sensible principles of Dave's email, etc. cetera. Um, so in other words, he's suggesting that the three of you, the three of you in this email chain, need to be clear about all live cases from this point forward, yes? That's what he's indicating. So you will have, uh, you, Mr. Ismay and Miss Talbot, will have kept a bit of a watching brief thereafter on that case. Is that a fair assumption? Um, I don't recall. It's not necessarily the case, just because someone wrote me an email and said that's what they're doing. So are you saying that you don't remember the West Byfleet trial, the Seema Misra trial? Uh, I don't particularly recall it when it's obviously come out over the last couple of years, so it didn't trigger anything. I don't recall it. So when he suggests that there needs to be, uh, uh, the three of you need to keep an eye on all live cases, you just ignored that, did you? No, we obviously must keep a look on all live cases, but I, I don't recall looking out for this particular one uh, on its own. Even in the context of the fact that the uh, challenge to the integrity of Horizon was the key theme in that case? Sorry, I, I don't recall. All right. Well, uh, let's take that document down then and uh, look at the next one, which is the only other one I'm going to show you. It's FUJ 0015 And if we just uh, go down to the end of this <coughs> two-page chain, we can see this is an email from someone called Tom Lillywhite, and he's at Fujitsu. Yes? Yes. Is that a name that rings a bell or not particularly? No. Well, if we go up just to the top of this email... We can see that he sent you this email on the 14th of September 2010, and he's copied in two others. And he says, John, the email text I promised 
following our telephone call. So evidently the two of you have spoken just prior to him sending this message, yes? Does that make sense to you? Yes. And he says this. Our RMG Account Fraud and Litigation Service are currently acting on an ARQ, and he gives the reference. This request for transaction records, which covers March 2010, is in respect to an outlet, Derby, which is already migrated to HNGX. He says this, because of a number of technical issues, errors detected, that arose during migration up to June 2010, and which poll technical specialists are aware of, the information gathered in respect to this particular ARQ may be subject to issues of integrity. Our technical staff have investigated the record in question, and at this stage, although they report that there's no obvious evidence of suspicious behaviour, they can add nothing further with any certainty, and they do not have the ability to determine if there really are any financial implications with the messages. In other words, any response from us would have to bear the health warning that there was no guarantee as to the integrity of the data provided by us. The issue is of particular relevance in light of the fact that provision of an ARQ could result in a request for a statement of witness to support litigation activity. As such, any statement of witness provided would in real terms have to reflect this. So let's just uh, be clear about what he's saying there. He's saying that uh, an ARQ request has come through for a particular outlet, that is Derby. An ARQ request is evidently one where there's been somebody in your team, the security team, have asked for data from the branch, yes? I presume so, yes. And what he's saying is that because of a known issue, they can't say that that data has any integrity. Yeah? So there is a known issue about Horizon data integrity. On that particular one, yes. And he's alerting you to it. Yes? Yes. If we go further up, we can see your response. On the 18th of September, you respond and you say, Tom, thank you for your telephone call and email in regards to the matter below just to let you know the outcome. The ARQ was raised due to a key entry discrepancy in a customer deposit. There is no investigation in this matter and will therefore not be used in court. I would also be grateful if you could advise if there are any other ARQs at risk. Uh, if we scroll up, we can see that seems to be um, pretty much the end of it, the matter as far as you are concerned. What you don't say is you've alerted my attention to a known Horizon data integrity issue. Do you? Uh, no, not, not that I can see. Uh, this is in September 2010. This is just after you had received the Rod Ismay August 2010 report which claimed that there were no horizon integrity issues. Do you see anything problematic about your response, Mr. Scott? I can see that it was a known technical issue. It was known, it was, they went to the root cause to understand it, and therefore, from my perspective, looking at that, it's an isolated issue that has known, root caused, and resolved. What led you to think it was a known, root caused issue? Um, from the, well, it says it's a technical issue. Yes. From what I've seen there. I mean, yes. I've literally only just seen this. I don't recall seeing this document before. There's nothing in it that suggests that this is a uh, limited issue or that it's only related to this branch. It's a known issue. And you haven't raised it, have you, with Mr. Ismay, who's just written a report on the integrity of Horizon? I don't recall whether I have or not. And you haven't raised it with the SEMA Misra defence team, who were that, at that very time conducting a defence which raised the issue of the integrity of Horizon. I, sorry, I, I don't recall. Do you wish to take any share of responsibility? 
the fact that your team, you in particular, knew about a Horizon data integrity issue in the month before Seema Misra was tried and convicted. Do you wish to take any responsibility for the failure to disclose that to her team? Um, I can see it. Um, I don't know whether I did disclose it or not or forward it on. Uh, if I should have done, my apologies. Um, but I don't know whether I did or didn't. I just can't recall. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. Page. So is that it, Mr. Beer? Yes, it is, sir. Well, thank you for your witness statements. Uh, and thank you for coming to give oral evidence um, and answering a good many questions. Can I just confirm so, um, I'm released and have to speak to my lawyers? Yes. Yes, yes that's thank right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so we start again at 10 o'clock tomorrow, Mr. Beer, yeah? Yes, Rob Wilson. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>